folks, I just want to flag that this meeting is being recorded. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Grassroots Carbon Rancher to Rancher Learning Series. If folks would like to drop your name and where you are from or an organization you might be affiliated with in the chat box, that would be a great way for us to get to know each other via chat box. Um, today, we are lucky to host Lee Reinhardt as he shares the year-long past year. I'm just going to name a few housekeeping items before we get started. So today, Lee's going to share information and slides. And while Lee is talking, if you want to drop any questions in the chat box, we can let those accrue essentially until Q&A time starts. So we'll ask folks to hold questions until then, but please feel free to drop those questions in the chat box while they're at the tip of your, your mind. Um, our next Rancher to Rancher learning session will take place in April and focus on fire ecology and restoration. So please stay tuned to Grassroots Communications via email and newsletters for specific details as we pivot towards supporting our Texas Panhandle Ranch community. So yeah, we are super stoked to have Lee here today as we talk about setting up summer rotations, mastering um, animal movements, and implementing summer and winter strategies. Lee Reinhardt is an educator working with NCATS ATRA Sustainable Agriculture, Soil for Water, and Arm to Farm programs. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Animal Science and a Master of Education in Agricultural Education, both from Texas A&M University. He has published numerous articles and podcasts on agroecological topics, ranging from reducing fertilizer use to improving profitability on livestock operations, including many how-to articles, podcasts, and educational videos on pasture and cover crops. I will drop Lee's email in the chat box and any other resources as well. We will send to you um, with a recording of this um, after this session. So Lee, thanks so much, and I will hand the mic to you. Very good. Thank you, Amy. And Thanks for inviting me to um, to have this talk with everyone in the network today. Um, certainly, it's an opportunity to have a mutual learning experience. Um, you know, I can share some of the things that I've done and things that I've seen and heard about and and observed and read about. And um, there's has to be an awful lot of experience here within this virtual room as well. And so um, as we do the question and answer uh, session, you know, certainly I welcome any questions that you might have, um, any other comments that you might have, or some things, um, how have some things worked on your own place? And what are some of your observations, specifically when it comes to like extending that grazing season? Um, so thanks again, Amy. I'm really happy to be here. So let's dive in. I figured I would probably talk for, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes or something like that. Um, and uh, if it generates any comments or questions that you might have, feel free to put those in the chat. We can talk about that in the in the question and answer period afterwards. So with that, I think I'll go ahead and share my screen and get ready to move here. Okay. Everybody see that just fine? Okay. All right, very good. So this is what we're going to do today. I figured that we would um we'd have a little discussion on the year-long pasture and why the year-long pasture. Um obviously, um you know, the the more we can graze, the, the the more we can save on money, and certainly build help build and restore uh, pastures and ecosystems. Um, livestock we know can be an excellent tool for managing landscapes, and you know when it's when it's done um, in you know in you know uh, intentionally with intentional 
you know, animal impact at the right time, the right place for the right amount of time, it can really be a game changer whenever it comes to um, pasture longevity, um, ecosystem function, uh, water holding capacity, and all those things, right? So, um, you know, the more we can graze them, the more we can utilize these pastures, we can certainly build those, those um, ecosystem processes. But not only that, you know, we can we can significantly reduce um, inputs that we have on on the farmer ranch throughout the year. Everybody knows that feed costs are one of the highest um, expenses that any farmer rancher are going to have on a uh, on an agricultural operation. Um, I was looking at the uh, the the. Um, the ERS um, Economics Research Service with some facts and figures here recently. And um, it's just amazing that the cost of inputs has shot up precipitously, including feeds, um, while the, uh, the on-farm receipts of agricultural products has remained stagnant. And it's just, it's just you know, not, not a way to stay sustainable if we have to spend so much money feeding our livestock. So how do we develop a system where we can graze longer throughout the year? That's what I thought we would talk about today. So um, grazing as much as possible throughout the year is certainly possible. Many of you probably do that. Um, I know many people have done it. I have grazed throughout the winter um, on the Texas Gulf Coast. Um, I learned I learned basically how to do this um, by uh, by developing a rotational system and overseeding uh, annual ryegrass and Dutch white clover and running running my heifers through. I just I did it as an experiment because I'd never done any type of rotational grazing before. This was back in like nineteen I think ninety seven or something like that. First time I ever tried it. And um, just to watch those heifers run through these these small paddocks with daily movements and having the pastures um, uniformly grazed, um, even weeds, curly dock would come up and the curly dock would just be stems sticking up straight. They would they would take everything off. Right. So I, I, I learned to kind of intuit what was going on there. Um, within that system where where animals could uh where animals could get in whenever they were a little bit more confined for a shorter period of time really kind of took away their desire to to be lackadaisical they wanted to get the job done they went in there and they ate right and then we'd get them off and then we'd allow those paddocks um adequate rest for full recovery before we brought them back in and um i did an economic analysis on that as well and it was significantly cheaper um, to actually oversee ryegrass and uh, and and buy polytape than it was to uh, to buy hay to feed those heifers throughout that winter. So um, you know those and, and then and then on top of that, just all the experiences that I've had um, on other ranches moving forward and friends and family who have been doing this for years um, have been uh, have been able to. Uh, really increase the, the the amount of time that they're actually you know grazing on land so so some of the elements i think that we that we'd like to cover is like um when you're thinking about uh, extending your grazing season uh, to cover more of the of, of the year where do you start you know um where's a good place to to start where does where does your year start right I've all, I've always thought my year starts in the fall because that's a that's whenever I start planning that's when everything starts shifting and I'm going into winter. Everybody has a different thing, but but um, trying to pick a place to to start so that you know that that from that point on you can actually build a sustainable system with appropriate animal numbers is really important. And one of the things that that I've often thought is important and and um, and uh, and I learned this, uh, you know, through a colleague, um, um, Justin Morris, uh, who uh, used to work with us, but he's he was with uh, NRCS Soil Health Division in the mid in the Midwest for quite some time. And he said, Lee, the best time to really uh, start, um, 
you know, developing your winter grazing plan is during the summer, right? You start it during the summer and then back up and build your summer grazing plan based upon what you believe your carrying capacity for the winter is going to be. And that's counterintuitive because the way I grew up, it was conventional grazing and, and um, you know, we would have some pretty long, you know, rotations, um, four or five pastures on the ranch moving around, you know, every couple of months or so. Um, and, you know, we, we fed hay during the winter. So we, we, we thought of summer as making hay and grazing as much as you can. And then so that you have hay to feed in the winter, right? And of course we had all the expenses that go with that. We had, you know, machinery costs and we had time and, you know, we had, you know, all of, all of that that goes into maintaining hay fields and everything, right? Um, but when Justin told me to think about your winter carrying capacity and what you could actually carry on stockpiled forage in the winter and then adapt your summer, a summer program to that, um, then you're kind of setting yourself up for a little bit better situation. So when you go into the winter, you have enough forage left over in order to keep the whole herd fed. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that, about planning during the summer. Planning during the summer means really managing those summer rotations, right? And really making sure that you're taking advantage of adequate rest and and making sure your grazing frequency, how often you come back to those paddocks, is staggered enough to maintain the health of that pasture sward, so that we, so they, so the animals get the protein and the the energy that they need. But then also we've got enough photosynthetic uh, leaf area left there for full regrowth, right? We want to have full regrowth all the way through that summer to really build that diversity and to build the resiliency of that pasture sward so that we can so that we can anticipate good stockpile to carry us through the fall and the winter around to the next um, around to the next season. So that full summer regrowth is going to be really important to set up that stockpile to reduce those costs. So again, like like I said, in preparing for that winter grazing, I think it's important, you know, that we look at our um, stocking those summer pastures for the winter carrying capacity, um, and that can be pretty easy to do, you know, if you basically know, you know, how much, for instance, how much hay that you've usually got off of fields. If you were to convert those hay fields into pasture right? You have an idea of what the yield is in tons per acre, and you can kind of figure, like, what is the standing amount of forage that I could expect to be out there on a good year, right? Um, and you can kind of calculate, um, uh, you know, what your carrying capacity might be. Um, so we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to start off in the summer, figuring what that carrying capacity is going to be, and then we're going to start that summer rotation, with uh with with our poly braid with our step in posts you know with using using some type of an adaptive grazing situation where we're rotating um you know pretty heavily right so we want to get good animal impact on the land keep them on for grazing periods of less than you know less than three days if we can um so that we don't have regrazing of new growth um and just really build that resilient system and during that time, whenever we first start grazing in the in, in the spring, we're going to begin immediately setting up our stockpile system, right? And all of this, you know, takes um, some of the tools that you're probably very familiar with, portable watering systems that are easy to use, um, that are inexpensive, um, poly braid and step in posts. You know, um, Alan Williams says it's the best tool you can have on your farm or ranch for, for managing uh, livestock um, in a regenerative way. And because that allows us to really um, allow that, that the grass stand to have full recovery. You know, a lot of people say, well, when, when is it, when is the grass fully recovered? When should I put the animals back onto a paddock after they've grazed? Um, how much recovery time do they need? And of course, that depends on so many things, where you're located. Are you north? Are you south? Are you, are you having 
uh, dry or dry summers or wet summers? Uh, what types of grasses do you have, warm season or cool season? Um, but typically what we want is that full recovery for whatever grass species um, is predominant out there. For instance, if it's cool season perennials, um, we usually know that those grasses are coming into full recovery. They're ready to be grazed again whenever that first bottom basal leaf has started to turn brown, right? At about that time, it's starting to shift its reserves. It's starting to get ready to go reproductive. It still has a really good balance of protein to nitrogen in it. In fact, it's optimum for animals. Um, and so that's probably a good time for those cool season grasses. You know that's, that it's time for that to, for that to be uh, grazed again. And then of course, throughout that summer season, while you're building that stockpile to always leave grass behind, you know, um, keeping those animals in for a short enough period of time that they take off maybe half of what's there and then they are moved to the next paddock. And then uh, that grass that's left behind is your bank, and that's going to start photosynthesizing, and it's going to uh, allow for, for, for regrowth and full recovery again. Even whenever you're in drought, pastures that have been treated this way, um, it's amazing that you leave more grass like that and get them off. It buffers soil temperatures. Um, there's so much organic matter in the soil and so much nutrient cycling and water holding capacity that they are much more drought resistant as well. So leaving that grass residual behind is going to be really important. So thinking about the summer, um, you know, I mentioned two things, frequency and recovery. I think these are two principles that are really important to remember as we're building. Because remember, whenever we're grazing, um, you know, our summer pastures in the beginning, you know, May, you know, late April, May, you know, up into early June, right? That whole period is really important for, for building out, you know, our system of, of, of winter grazing so that we have enough stockpile and we have quality stockpile there um, to carry us through the whole year, right? So grazing uh, frequency and recovery are very important concepts. Um, and, and the reason why I think this is so important is because whenever we have proper grazing frequency, and in, in other words, the, the number of times or how often we come back to a paddock to, to regraze it and how often we do, and then recovery, again, that, that plants having the ability to fully recover, not too long and not too, not too short, right? Um, those two principles, um, if we run, if we run that um, a really good balance there, we can really increase our plant diversity, right? And plant diversity we know has so many important aspects, nutritional aspects for the animals, uh, phytonutrients, antioxidants, all of these things um, that are really necessary for animal health and well-being, and then subsequently our own uh, health and well-being as well, um, you know, it just improves with plant diversity. Um, so we can we can really foster that planting diver that plant diversity by how frequently we go back and how much recovery period we give to those uh, to those pastures. Um, we know that the more plant diversity we have, the more soil aggregation improves, right? Because we're building that habitat for microorganisms and really ramping up that nutrient cycling with huge imports of carbon. Right, uh, we have better pore space. We have better water infiltration and gas exchange and photosynthesis and plant growth. Plant growth, all of that stuff accrues from how we manage in the summer. Right. So, for instance, if you look at the chart here, we have on the left the plant diversity either goes high or low, um, and that is a function really of how we manage that grazing frequency and recovery period. If our great, if our say, let's say our recovery period is very short, well, you'll notice that we're not coming back in time for there to be good regrowth. We're going to start lowering the plant diversity in that paddock because they haven't, those plants have not had enough time to regrow. Other opportunistic plants, namely weeds and things like this, are going to come and take over, right? We see this a lot, especially in continuous grazing situations, right? Otherwise, if your recovery period is too long, you'll notice also that there will be um, a, 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 a lot less plant diversity as well because 
the plants have become wolfish. They have become too big. They are they're starting to mature. Now you're starting to get, you know, uh, you know, funguses in there and natural senescence and disease and this and that. And um and and a lot of biomass there. So a lot of the other you know, good plants that are underneath that canopy really don't have a way to come up and express themselves. But if we find that sweet spot right there in the middle where you see the top of that arc of the red graph of recovery period, um, that that really allows us to uh, to take advantage of um, of allowing all of those you know opportunistic plants, good plants that that would contribute to that. Um, soil and pasture biome to express themselves, right? Because the plants, the plants were um, uh, livestock were put onto the paddock whenever the plants were at the proper stage of grazing, and then they weren't grazed down too fat, too 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 short, right? Your grazing frequency um, was was right on the spot as well. Um, you're not revisiting that paddock too much to stunt those plants. So I think, you know, the, this whole idea of, of grazing frequency and recovery is so important when we think of, um, uh, you know, managing our summer rotations, right, in order to build that soil, build a really good uh, pasture system is going to carry over. And we can see how that would carry over and benefit um, uh, our stockpile situation for the winter. So how's that done? I mean, you know, uh, certainly we have, you know, many of you have probably grazed many of these different types of systems and all the different iterations in w w within the gradations between continuous grazing and regenerative grazing, right? So, you know, on like on the far left, we have continuous grazing. The animals are never moved off of this pasture, perhaps for a whole grazing season, right? Or maybe it's a very extensive type of rotation where, where they are left on for, you know, a couple of months and then maybe move to another paddock whenever a pasture, whenever that one has been has been grazed too hard. Um, but continuous grazing, if you'll, I mean, what that's doing, if if you look back at our at our graph, you know, you can see where the grazing frequency would be high, right? Because there's there's they're staying on there the whole time. And your recovery period is is very, very sh um, short, right? So your plant diversity is going to tank in that situation, right? Um, so if we were to split that up and do some type of rotation, we're going to get some benefits of that. We're going to see some improvements, right? So your conventional rotational grazing, and this is kind of what I learned back in the 90s. We called it MIG, management intensive grazing back then, and it's gone through so many different iterations of, you know, in evolution since then, you know, um, where you separate several paddocks and then you move animals um, maybe every week or so, every couple of weeks or something like that. Um, here, uh, you know, you're um, you're getting a little bit uh, uh, better pasture use, a little bit more efficient use, um, but but you're still um, not able without enough paddocks. You're really not able to take advantage of those principles of frequency and full recovery. Right. In addition, you can see that with these more extensive types of grazing systems, like the continuous or even the conventional rot rotational grazing. Um, you don't get a lot of a uniformity either of forage utilization or of manure and urine deposition, right? So that can be so patchy, right? The grazing can be patchy and the manure distribution can be very patchy as well, right? So um, if we look at what we're calling this regenerative grazing situation, which I like to call adaptive multi-paddock grazing, um, is where maybe you take that uh, conventional rotational grazing system and you just start to break those paddocks up a little bit, a little bit smaller, and take advantage of this uh, of 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 having um, the optimal grazing frequency and the optimal uh, plant recovery period, right, for full recovery of that plant. Those animals may be staying in those paddocks for a day to or a day or two and then moving you'll notice that you get a lot more efficient utilization of the pasture resource as well as uh, nutrient deposition by the animals, right? And you get, you'll be uh, grazing these paddocks probably no more than about 5% of the time at any one time. 5% of those pastures are actually be gra being grazed 
95% of those pastures are in the recovery period. Soil microorganisms and such uh, doing their job of nutrient cycling uh, and photosynthesis in order to, 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 to build the resilience of that system. So, you know, if let's say we were to take this uh, regenerative grazing situation on the right and say, well, how would you move animals through there? And this is just your basic strip grazing situation. Many of you are probably familiar uh, with, with options like this. Um, but essentially, this is where we'll have a paddock and we have animals that are ready go, to go into a next paddock. We have the red dotted lines are our polytape. Um, what we do is we just start uh, moving that. We'll just roll it up as we walk, right? We just uh, walk across the, the pasture, rolling that up. And as we do this, the animals will tend to just form a line and just come right into the paddock as a line and start immediately going after that new forage, right? This is a really good way to, to, um, to, uh, to get high intake uh, gain uh, from, a, from a pasture, right? From, from, from how you could move your animals such that you can encourage the highest gain that the animals could get. If you really were wanting to trample a lot of this, instead of uh, rolling that poly tape all the way, I would probably only open it up about 20 feet or so and then let the animals move around. And instead of doing this where they just walk right in, they're going to just do more of this situation where they're just going to walk in and everybody will come in from a from this narrow gate. One animal will stop and start eating. The other animal will pass it, stop and start eating. The other animal will pass that animal, stop and start eating. And so you have this, uh, uh, this kind of this, this uh, mechanized uh, approach of the animals moving in and it tends to trample the grass in the forage a lot better. So if you really wanted to trample a lot of that forage down onto the ground to increase the, uh, you know, the biomass that's going to be incorporated into that paddock, that would be a way to do it. So there's a lot of different strategies that you could use here, you know, but these animals are going to go in. And then, of course, you can take your polywire, set up your next, uh, your next day's portion. And um, usually you're not going to need a back fence on these things unless unless those animals are going to have access to that grazed pasture after three or five days. I wouldn't worry about a back fence. Um, if 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 you know they're going to be on that pro on that uh, previously grazed after five days or so, a back fence to prevent them from doing that would certainly be warranted. So you know that's just a really good um, I think example of of how you could have your summer grazing rotations, um, you know, being developed to really. Uh, foster you know, growth and productivity of the forage resource so that you can bank it for uh, for the um, for the fall and the winter. And um, I recently came across uh, I've been doing a lot of work with Virginia um, with Virginia Tech and um, and with uh, American Farmland Trust and and uh, Virginia Association for Biological Farming lately um, doing some soil for water work down there. And uh, one of the things that I came across in my travels there was this paper that was put out by Virginia uh, Tech Extension um, on using a summer stockpiling system to ex extend the uh, grazing season. And I think this shows an awful lot of promise for many regions of our country. Um, essentially, what this is doing is um, starting off the system uh, right, right off the bat. Uh, this is from this is from the paper, um, and uh, uh, I'll see if I can find a way to to post the link to this if somebody is interested in downloading the paper. Um, essentially, what what they were doing with this research is taking a quarter of their of of the land base of the grazing land base, and they were excluding it from livestock right off the bat, right at the beginning, and then they would graze the other seventy five. Uh, percent of the acreage uh, with this uh, with this rotational system, right? With an adaptive rotational system, where you're a lot more um, efficient, and uh, you know, and and you're really allowing uh, those the, those grasses and those those forbs to express their full genetics, right? By by giving them full recovery and uh, and limited grazing. 
So what they did was they 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 would section this off. And so, you know, from about April to mid-July, this is how they would do it. And they would graze through the 75%. And then after that, uh, what they would do is somewhere around mid-July, they would take another 25% of that uh, of those of that grazing resource and they would exclude that as well. And they would continue those rotational grazing practices. Um, until about mid-August, that's we're starting to get into that summer slump now, right? So they would they would uh, they would they would continue grazing that, and then they would let uh, both of those other fifty percent continue to grow for stockpile. And then what they do do after that is in um, in mid-August, they would take the animals off of the summer pasture that they were on that fifty percent put it onto the 25% that they had set aside to begin with at, um, at, um, let me get this out of the way. Okay. Um, they would put it on this 25 acres that they'd set aside at the beginning of the grazing season, and they would strip graze this, um, moving the fence about every three days. Okay. And what they found is that in, in, in this system, and they did a lot of, you know, nutrient uh, uh, um, uh, tests and such and, and foliar tests on what the nutrient composition uh, of the forage was, both through cannula and through, uh, and through uh, um, forage testing. And they found that overall, they were anywhere from 10 to 12% crude protein on that strip graze summer pasture with about 60 to 61% total digestible nutrients which is pretty good uh, feed. Um, you think about all of the good stuff that's underneath there. Now, this is going to this is gonna be seeded out by now. You know, uh, that strip graze that you're going to be doing in August is probably going to be seeded out. Uh, there's a lot of dry matter there, and there's a lot of stuff underneath that canopy that the animals are going to be getting to as well. So strip grazing it, moving that fence about every three days is a really efficient way to do that. So you're still, uh, you're now you're resting the rest of the whole uh, of the whole um, of the whole ranch at this point. And then after that, in about mid-October into December, they moved the animals off of the strip graze, put them on the other 25% that they had uh, set aside um, in July, and they strip grazed that as well. Um, and, and that'll take them into the winter. And then you can see that about 60 days of, of regrowth um, has gone into this 50% that has continued to fall stockpile. And um, voila, in December, the animals can go onto that and strip graze that until it's done. And I know a lot of people who are doing this kind of thing and getting anywhere from, you know, 340 to 350 days of grazing a year. You know, you'll always want to have some hay in the barn for some of those years, right? That's our insurance. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting uh, way to conceptualize, you know, how could I, you know, uh, uh, you know, develop a stockpile system and apportion the land and would be very interested to see if this is anything that um, anyone in this virtual room has done or is thinking about doing because it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, one of my partners down in Virginia is Gil Yearwood with Ellet Valley Beef Company, and he raises uh, South Pole's uh, uh, grass finished um, and uh, uses uses uh, um, no for, no fertility on the fields whatsoever. Everything is 100% grass grass finished um, for all of his animals, and he's been doing this for quite some time. A story that he tells me is that. Um, several years ago, uh, he, you know, he wasn't putting on nitrogen or anything because he's been grazing regeneratively for decades. So he's got some really good soil structure, you know, really good water holding capacity and, and nutrient cycling. Um, but it's always recommended to, uh, to, you know, top dress, you know, your, your, uh, your winter stockpile with nitrogen. Uh, and a lot of people do that, you know, and one thing that it does do is it can increase the protein, you know, content of the forages sometimes. But he was noticing that he wasn't getting any more grazing days after uh, fertilizing than if he didn't fertilize. So he just stopped fertilizing altogether. 
And um, that would be a train wreck for somebody who was certainly fertilizing, you know, often. And I never recommend that. The reason that Gil could do that is because for decades he's been he's been grazing, uh, uh, you know, completely grass fed, grazing as much of the year as possible, and um, and building that building that really healthy uh, healthy soil with good structure, with good habitat and good nutrient cycling. Um, he's been able to sell his his all of his hay machinery, and uh, he'll just purchase in a little bit of hay that he needs. Uh, for, uh, to carry him over for a couple of weeks um, if he can't, you know, make the whole year. Um, but um, it's a it's a it's a pretty big deal to go from say 250 days of grazing a year to to 350 days of grazing. It can be, it can be a really big uh, boon to your uh, to your pocketbook for sure. So I did want to cover some alternatives before I stop and we kind of talk about any questions or comments that somebody might have. But you know, there's other alternatives as well, and many are are using summer annuals. Uh, there's all kinds of summer annuals that can work within a grazing uh, rotation system, especially during that summer slump. For those who have um, who have uh, cool cool season perennials, um, summer annuals can really fill that gap. You know, uh, grazing things like sorghum sudan or cowpeas. Um, I know people who will plant cowpeas and then they'll come right under it with with annual ryegrass. And whenever the whenever the animals go through the the cowpeas, they'll come back in the rotation and the ryegrass has come up and for some good fall grazing. So there's different ways that this can be done. Sun hemp is another uh, warm season uh, that works in uh, the pretty well in the in in uh, the southern parts of of our country. Um, crabgrass and annual rye, uh, annual ryegrass, you know, uh, the Noble Foundation has done an awful lot of work with ryegrass and with, with annual crabgrass. Crabgrass is really palatable. And, um, and a lot of times we'll see it come up in pastures that have just been really hammered with grazing. Uh, you'll see that come up and it's kind of got that prostrate type of growth pattern. Um, because it's kind of an opportunistic, you know, uh, warm season annual type grass. But it's very palatable, and if it's managed correctly, it can be a really good stopgap um, for pastures that have been really hammered. You know, you can go in and uh, and you can broadcast it with uh, with some with some white clover, um, and you know, drag drag the fields and and get a rain and get some uh, you know get some good greenery out there for the summer. So there's some stopgaps that we can that we can uh, pull in to our toolbox for the various mm -hmm. types of situations we might find ourselves in, uh, you know, with low forage production in, in the summer. Um, and then of course it's not here, but another one that I like to herald a lot is, is warm season, native warm season perennials. Um, probably the best thing you could po possibly have on your ranch if you're in a region where you could have uh, big blue stem, uh, yellow Indian grass, switch grass, these types of, of, of native grasses that are really resilient, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, resilient when it comes to water use efficiency and, um, and hold their palatability uh, um, really well um, and, can, and can be a stopgap. Uh, problem there, of course, is, is if you don't have them, getting them established, you know, can, can be um, kind of tricky. Um, usually it takes, you know, several years for a really good native warm season stand to get established. But those are just some of the alternatives. So I think we've talked about, you know, adding these alternatives. We've talked about, uh, you know, setting up your summer system for your winter system and then, you know, developing some type of, of, of grazing schedule where you could start uh, pulling pastures, you know, out of the grazing system uh, to have stockpile grazing all the way from the late summer into into the midwinter, um, certainly possible. So I do have several resources here, and if I can, I'll put these into the chat. Maybe if there's a way for me to get the slides available, if people need them, we can do that as well. Um, but I'll share these uh, as we go. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. I, we got 20 minutes. That's what you said you wanted for for questions and comments and stuff. So I'll I'll turn it over to you and see where yeah. we're going. 
Thank you so much, Lee. Yep, right on the money. Um, I'm just gonna read out your first question in the chat box from Sarah. Sarah is asking, what about places where there's both a summer and a winter dormant season? On our Texas ranch, we sometimes have to feed more hay in the summer than the winter. We can plan for winter dormancy, but when we have three months without rain and 100 degree days, how do we compensate or stockpile for that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, a lot of times without water, um, that's 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 our limiting factor, um, especially since about 2015, whenever the droughts really hit Texas hard, you know, um, uh, that's 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 often going to be the limiting factor is water, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, in those situations, uh, what, you know, prior, you know, we, we, destocking is the last resort. And sometimes that has to happen. Sometimes we can find neighboring pastures or something. But what I try to do is just slow down my rotation, right? I want to do whatever I can uh, as early as possible to give the grass that I have already grazed the longest regrowth period that I possibly can, right? So, and that's gonna work to a point, right? Um, if you finish the rotation out and then you still haven't had rain, that's whenever you have to come into a decision of like, how do I get these animals off this off this place, right? If I can't feed hay, right? How can I do that? Um, so other than that stopgap, I think that's probably my biggest recommendation is how do I, how do I, uh, increase the number of days that my plants are recovering after a grazing period. And you do that by slowing down your grazing rotation and possibly just, just opening, making the paddocks bigger, you know, that type of thing. Great. Um, I'm seeing a question from Don. Don is asking, what is a good resource to find what the carrying capacity of our ground is? Okay, very good. Um, uh, Don, where, where's Don? Where, where are you located, Don? Did you say? Yeah, and Don, if you want, you can unmute Nebraska. Don's in Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, so we're looking uh, probably tall grass prairie, maybe uh, transition short grass warm season. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a, a resource that that I put together with some of my colleagues, and this draws on a lot off an awful lot of stuff that you can find in extension and such. But I'll uh, I'll, I'll see if I can post this somehow or make sure you get this. Um, we wrote a paper um, on um, on adaptive grazing, and within it, uh, there's there's a pretty simple way of kind of calibrating your eye is to like, what, what is, you know, how can I figure out what the carrying capacity of my land is? And essentially what we recommend is at least, at least one of your years do a physical measurement. Um, there's, there's, you know, our, our publication goes through how you can, you know, develop a ring or a quadrant or something, and you can take actual, you know, clipping samples and, um, you can either weigh it in the microwave or you can you, uh, dry it in a microwave or just weigh it and multiply it by a, a factor for, uh, uh, for, for dry matter. And you know, through, a, through a couple of calculations, you can get an idea of what the, the, the dry matter uh, yield is on that field, right? Um, that's probably, that, that is very hands-on. Right. And but it gives you the best um, estimate of what's happening on your property. Right. So that you can say, OK, you know, I know that I that this field, you know, uh, produced twenty five hundred pounds per acre. Right. That's how much I just came up with. Right. And so it's probably going to do that if you have a regenerative grazing situation where you are having adequate regrowth and 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 you're having adequate grazing frequency, um, you're gonna have about that much um, regrowth given 
good water situation all throughout the grazing season, right? That's how, that's why I say adaptive regenerative grazing is more efficient, right? Because you're allowing it to completely regrow and then you can come back in and you can harvest and you can control that harvest. So um, I'll see if I can put that resource. It's it's called um, um, pa Pasture Rangeland and Adaptive grazing is the ATRA publication that we have. And it's on our website for free. It breaks down how to how to actually do these, um, how, how to, <clears throat> to do this uh, assessment and how to do the calculations. And then once you know what, how many pounds of dry matter you have out there, it's a simple matter of matching that up to the animal, to the, to the animal weight, the, the weight of the herd or the flock. Right, because we know that let's say cattle require three percent of their dry matter daily. Right, so if we a thousand pound cow needs thirty pounds. Right, if we have ten thousand pound cows, we need three hundred pounds. You see, so you know what you've got, and you know how much you need. So um, that's how I recommend doing it. And then whenever you actually put the animals out, um, you 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 will. Um, you'll figure out, okay, this is the, uh, this is how many pounds of dry matter I have out here per acre. I want to use, I'm going to take it down to half. So I'm going to apportion off this, this much of an acre for this many cows for one or two days. And then you move them the next day and see how you did. Uh, was it, was the, uh, was the, um, was the panic too small? Was there too much trampling? Was it too big? Were the animals laying down after two or three hours? You know, uh, those types of things. Um, and you can gauge, basically. That's why we call it adaptive management. We base our next move and our next paddock size based upon what we've observed happen in the past. What else? Awesome. Let's see. Yeah, folks who are on here, uh, please don't don't be shy um, if you want to take advantage of Lee's expertise while we're here. I think I saw someone who is a future ranch owner. Um, cool. Yeah, any questions are you know fair game around adaptive yeah. management and grazing. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes, absolutely. I have a question about uh, broadcasting seed. What what time of the year would be great for broadcasting white clover on uh, an existing hay field in Virginia? Do you know that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, right now, actually, would be a good time to do that. Um, let me get you back up here. Um, yeah, because right now, um, is what we would call the frost seeding period. Um, in fact, it's getting a little warmer <laughs> um, lately, uh, quicker. So I would say um, any time from February to March would be a good time to broadcast uh, clover on on the on the fields in your area. I would even do it now um, where I am up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, we're actually having 60 degree days, you know, the freeze thaw period is kind of getting past us already, but you want to shoot for that period whenever the soil is freezing and thawing direct during a 24 hour day. So maybe you're getting up to 45 or 50 degrees in a day and you're back down to like 27 or something at night. When that happens, of course, the, 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 the soil freezes and thaws and it moves a little bit. And that's a good time to oh, to broadcast those small seeded clovers. Um, maybe run a, 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 a drag or something, something to get those seeds down underneath the grass canopy that's there so they can come into contact with that soil. And then that freeze thaw action of the soil will aid in seed to soil contact and, and with germination. So now's a good time to do that. Great question. Um, okay, we have a question from Aaron. You mentioned that one might leave 50% 50 50 of the dry matter in a field and move the cattle onto the next field. Is that a rule of thumb recommendation? 
Is there any oh. reference you could provide on this topic of how much grass to leave? Yes. Okay. Um, so where that comes from is is kind of it's a rule of thumb. Um, back in the fifties, uh, you know, some some um, ex some experimenters, some range scientists, and such came up with this idea. Um, but through some through some studies that they were doing, even back in the forties and fifties, looking at root growth and root death based upon defoliation of above ground biomass. And what they found was that um, grasses could be defoliated to about 50% of the above ground biomass without having any uh, uh, negative effects of the, uh, of the below ground root mass, right? But if you took it past 50%, if it was like 60% defoliation or more, then the root, uh, the root biomass would precipitously decline. I mean, hugely, you would really lose a lot of root mass because you're losing all of that uh, ability to photosynthesize, right? And, and to allow regrowth. So you're stunting the plants basically, right? So that's where that 50% rule comes. Um, but um, but I, don't, I really don't stick to that. I, I use that as kind of like a baseline. Start at 50% and what's working, right? That's why we like to uh, use like this adaptive observation, what's working for you. Sometimes because of your management, you're gonna wanna take off a lot more. Let's say that it is, it's, it's fall and you want to do some overseeding or something, um, and and you're gonna you're you're gonna need to get seed to soil contact. Maybe you're gonna you know broadcast annual ryegrass or something, and so you're probably gonna take your animals out there and you're gonna hammer that pasture pretty hard, right? And you're gonna take it down to I don't know twenty percent, you know um, top growth, right? You want to do that in order to remove the that plant canopy to get that seed to soil contact. You're doing that for a management reason, right? And one time of doing that is not going to necessarily like hurt that plant, right? Um, if if you if you repeatedly do that, twenty percent defoliation over time, you're really going to um, seriously uh, negatively impact that pasture, right? So, um, so I would say that it really kind of depends upon what your goals are. Um, I've heard utilization rates of anywhere from, you know, 40 to 60% on average, right? Um, think about what you need. What you want to do is you want to leave uh, behind enough, enough residue, enough green plant matter to photosynthesize and allow the plant to regrow. And also to, to provide a canopy and to cover the soil and to keep that soil covered and to mitigate like, like high temperatures, right? Because bare soil, if it's 80 degrees outside and you got bare soil, that soil is probably 120 degrees, right? And the hotter it gets and the more that impacts soil microorganisms, right? So that so you want to do stuff like that. You want to you want to um, make sure that you have enough there for to, to get adequate regrowth and cover the soil. Um, so I can look for some references. Um, I've got plenty of references in some of the papers that we've written where we've talked about how much we need to defoliate and I would have to look those up and post them. Right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to post on the chat the um, the pasture rangeland and grazing publication, if anybody is interested. And uh, so that link will take you to the publication where I spoke about, um, you know, calculating, you know, your paddock sizes and what your carrying capacity is and matching it to the number of animals that you have. So that might be a, a, a useful resource for some. Thank you so much, Lee. I am going to drop Lee's email in the chat box. That's all right, Lee. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because there's some really good questions here and that probably require conversation, you know, as well. And I'd be very happy to talk, you know, more in depth about this, um, come up with some of these, you know, I could send you some of these references and resources that I've been talking about with carrying capacity 
or with uh, with overseeding um, legumes um, or, you know, the 50 percent rule. Right. You know, where's some scientific backup, you know, to back that up? And what is the what what does science say about, you know, the, the right amount of, of residue? So, yeah, we could definitely have those conversations. Awesome. And then Lee, I just wanted to give space if there's any upcoming events um, on the NCAT side um, mm -hmm. that you think folks might be interested or or I can just drop the general link to NCAT ATRA. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, the ATRA program, ATRA Sustainable Agriculture, you know, we've been doing uh, this type of work um, since about 1985, I think, you know, um, you know, try, trying to tell farmer stories about what's working and what's not and transferring good information from farmer to farmer. Um, so atra.org is a place to find all of our publications and educational events and such. One thing that we are doing, if anybody is going to be in the area of Fayetteville, Arkansas on um, Wednesday, the 8th of May through the 10th of May, we're having our annual in-person conference. We've got some some really good speakers lined up um, coming from uh, it'll be kind of a national audience, uh, but we'll be focused on resilience and building resilience in an age of of climate disruption. You know, and so we look to have some 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 good keynotes and some good farmer panels talking about um, appropriate technology, what 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 works on the land, um, and uh, incorporating livestock and cropland all kinds of topics that we're talking about here uh, in order to become more resilient um, agricultural, um, you know, producers on the ground. So thanks for that. That's that's um, May 8th to the 10th. So, um, I dropped the link uh, for, for folks. I dropped a link both to the NCAT website and then a link that will take you directly to the conference information. Um, Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And then Lee, Lee at NCAT.org. Um, Lee, thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. And um, yeah, folks will all receive a recording of this. Um, yeah, and just encourage you to dig into ATRA and CAT. And um, thank you again, everyone, for showing up. And thank you, Lee. Yeah, thanks for showing up. Thanks for your good questions. Um, really, really love getting on and talking to people who are making a difference on the land. You guys um, are the ones making it happen. Thank you. Agriculture is a, is a difficult job and it is one of the best in the world. And so thank you for what you're doing. Um, Amy, thank you for what you're doing as well, um, bringing people together in network like this. This is This is how we make change. So thank you for inviting me to be part of it. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.